Our guest today is Nellie Akalp, the founder and CEO of CorpNet, an online document filing service that helps small businesses file LLCs, corporations, and DBAs. And in full disclosure, she helped us file Small Business File Inc. with a 24-hour turnaround. We're going to speak with Nellie today about as an expert on business formation uh, and also as a successful small business owner, serial entrepreneur, and a mother of four. Welcome, Nellie. Thank you for having me, Reese. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about your first business because, uh, you know, I'm not sure if that was your fir very first business or that it was just the one previous to CorpNet, but you have an interesting experience of having, uh, you started a company and then you started another one very similar. So if you could tell us about the first company and how you started it and that kind of thing. My husband and I met in college uh, and uh, we decided that we realized that we had similar interests and we decided to go to law school. We got into two different law schools and while in law school, I was working a nine to five job, uh, paying for my way through law school and attending law school part time. And uh, he was going to Pepperdine and uh, one day I came home and he said, you know, I have a great idea said, what it is, what is it? And he said, uh, it's uh, incorporating online. Let's do incorporations online. And uh, we put up a one page website. He came up with the name mycorporation.com. We put up a one page website and uh, we got our first client and it started from there. Uh, soon thereafter, you know, he went off to take off, to take the bar exam and he asked me to quit my job and take care of the business. And, uh, you know, we make a good combination because he's the idea. He's the creator. He loves to create and bring ideas into life. And I'm more of the executor, like take that idea and grow it from where it is. So we make a good combination. And when he went to take the bar exam, I uh, turned our two bedroom apartment into a document filing service. So grew the business from there. From there, you know, moved in, bought a house, moved the operations into the basement of our uh, house, and then from there, it just ramped up. We moved into our first offices and finally settled in uh, the offices whereby we were approached by Intuit in 2005 and uh, sold the company. Wow. So, so when you when you uh, were still working at home, did you have employees at that time? Initially, uh, we would hire, you know, legal clerks and uh, interns from the law school and just friends who would help us. And then eventually when we moved into, when we bought our first house and moved the operations into our basement, we did hire one actual employee. So how, lo how long did it take you to ramp up the, the first company to where you felt like you were uh, profitable and it was going somewhere? I mean, how long was it before you said, hey, you know, this is going to work? You know, in all candor, Reese, the first company, I mean, it, it really, it was profitable from the minute we put up the one-page website because mycorporation.com, which is the name of the first company that I had originally founded, um, you know, it, it really came into play at the birth of the internet. And there wasn't a lot of online document filing services back then that offered a similar service such as ours. Um, maybe at the most four, including ours. So once we put up the one page website, we immediately would get order forms filled out and online orders. And even back then we didn't have method of payments to accept payments online. So people would actually uh, submit their orders online and then we would have to call them and obtain payment by a credit card over the phone. And it was actually working. And uh, so I would say literally from the time we launched the website, um, you know, until we started seeing profits was literally instantaneous. Wow, especially your costs were pretty low. Yeah, I mean, our costs were really low. My husband, uh, you know, he's a, he, he, he knows how to design websites and he can put up a one page website to this day. You know, he's a very, 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 um, experienced internet marketer, entrepreneur, SEO expert. So he, you know, we had him to do all the work and we didn't need to go to an outside web developer. That's great. Yeah, SEO was probably really just at its infancy at that point in time. It was, it was. Now it's a whole different ballgame. <laughs> How long was it before you sold the company? 
Uh, we founded the company in 1997, my first company, and then we had it up until 2005, at which point we were approached by Intuit, and uh, you know they wanted to acquire the company, and then we sold at that time. After then, we took about three years off and uh, decided to focus on my then three children, which I had at the time, and um, I realized, you know, I wasn't ready to retire, and I really had a passion for uh, inspiring entrepreneurs, educating entrepreneurs, and helping people with starting a small business, and I decided to start back up again in 2009 with my company, currently Corknet.com. Okay, great, and I, I, I want to talk to you about that. I just want to ask one question, because I'm always curious about this. Did they just contact you out of the blue, or did you somehow put the feelers out there that you were ready to sell? I never had an exit strategy in mind with our first company, and uh, this is the God honest truth. I got a voicemail that was transferred to me by my husband while working at the first company, and he just transfers the call and goes, hey, I think this is a business development opportunity. You may want to contact them. And then one thing led to another, and we realized that they were serious. And uh, they came out um, initially under the guise of a partnership, and then this conversation soon changed to one of acquisition. And uh, they were very, very, very adamant, and they wanted things to move pretty quickly. And uh, I remember, you know, when they asked me, you know, if I would sell the company, my my answer to them was, how do I put a price on something that I love to do each day? You know, I was so surprised. And uh, I remember one of the guys telling me, you know, one of the men in the, you know, khakis and, you know, their, 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 their uniform men telling me, you know, you better go and think long hard about this, you know, because this is not one of those things that come along all the time. And, you know, Phil and I thought about it and we felt the timing was right. And it was time for us to, uh, you know, uh, consider a, a change. You know, we never thought we were going to leave the company. Um, you know, once the acquisition happened, you know, things go differently with corporate America and for us it lost its entrepreneurial spirit and we decided it's time for us both to resign and just focus on our ourselves and we did that and it was the best uh, you know three years but you know how much shopping and traveling are you gonna do it kind of lo loses its allure after some time and you know I wasn't done retiring so right. I wanted to start back up again too young to retire so when you when you decided you wanted to start back up again uh, you started to think about well I imagine the conversation was well what do we want to start how did you come to the decision to sort of jump back in where you left off it seems like you know, um, it was actually, uh, you know, during the three years that I, you know, was under my non-compete, um, I tried and dabbled in a few other industries. You know, I uh, I did some stuff in the fitness industry. I, I love to work out. And uh, so I considered opening up a gym, a fitness boutique, a cardio boutique. I actually opened up a clothing line and uh, nothing really excited me as much as helping small business owners and inspiring them in starting a business and taking something that at, is at its birth stage or it's just an idea and then basically creating and exploding it, you know? And that really, really excited me most out of everything that I had dabbled in in that three years. And, you know, I, I, I you know, my husband and I went back and forth. He was very adamant about going into some sort of a lifestyle business. And, uh, you know, I was very, very convinced that I want to, you know, stick with what I know best. And so we uh, agreed to uh, starting back up again. And so uh, when you did start back up again, you had, so you were given what I think is an unusual and, un and sort of unique opportunity is it's like, okay, we're getting back into the business, but we can do it any way we want to. What what changed from the one to the other? What did you do differently from the first one to the second one? Well, I mean, you know, the time where we started MyCorporation.com was, again, during an economic climate where the Internet was just at its infancy. Whereas with Corpna.com, we came out in 2009 where we were 
dealing with a very uncertain economic climate, which was really, it was at the height of the recession, you know. So things were very different for us. And uh, more important than anything, you know, we were going to be the new kids on the block competing with what was once four competitors. Now, hundreds of thousands of competitors. I mean, God knows how many people there and, are. And some big ones, too. It, yes, in, including the 800-pound, you know, corporate giant, LegalZoom, and, you know, my old company, MyCorporation.com, which is now privately held, and uh, a few very other, you know, reputable companies. So we were going to be the new kids on the block. So that in and of itself was, you know, a big factor to consider. And, uh, you know, we came out and we, you know, we, we, we followed a lot of the old formulas soon and very soon to realize that, you know, everything was, had, had to be changed. Otherwise, we were going to fail really quickly. So this time when you started up, did you immediately start? You had some money now from the, I assume, from the, from the buyout. Did you start with a couple of employees and, a, and you know, an office? And, or did you start again back at home with a website? We, you know, with all my businesses, Reese, I always started at home, you know, so we literally started this company with my husband, myself, and another employee, and we started it off the dining room table of my current residence, and then uh, we, once the website launched, we moved our operations, I have a room off our garage, and we moved in there, and because at that point we would have to have hired an, an additional employee, and then in that you know in that in that room off our garage there was room for three people, and then my husband would work out of his office from our house out of our home office, and uh, after that you know within a year after we moved into our first office, um, which was about 1,200 square feet, and then about uh, about two months ago, we expanded in three times the space that we were in. Right. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah, I love hearing those stories. I mean, we ourselves were in the garage, and I have three rooms upstairs that are just solely devoted to editing and and, and yes. offices, and you know. So it's a, you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a wise way to start a business, you know, because uh, you never know what happens with a business. An idea and an idea is an idea until you decide what to do with that idea, and. In my opinion, it's always best to keep your costs low and at a minimum if you can and if you can afford it. Right. So now, did, does your uh, husband work full-time in the business now? or My husband and I both work full-time here at Corpna.com. Uh, we're business partners here, and uh, we're both the officers here at Corpna.com. That's terrific. Are there a few things that you specifically saw, hey, I don't want to do it like that. Now that we're starting again, let's let's... Let's do it differently, other than technically. I mean, just uh, in terms of operations or your your time or. We started out, you know, in the same industry, and we started out, you know, offering the same services, and um, you know, as our previous company. But you know, everything is going to be the, the, the you know, the, I mean, the process is the same, you know, but the people are different, and the way I ran the company before is so much different than how I run my company today. I mean, you know, in this day and age, everything boils down to dollars and numbers and profitability. Um, and for us, you know, we never had to worry about that with the first company because it ramped up so quickly and it was profitable from day one. With my current company, it's been a struggle from day one and literally just recently we've seen such a great success because we had to learn the hard way and train our mind to think differently you know everything has to be looked at at such a granular level and you have to look at everything you do with the business 
from a dollar standpoint? Does it make sense? Is it profitable? I mean, at one point we've even considered, is it even worth having salespeople here to make outbound calls? Because most of our business is through, you know, pay-per-click, you know, and we get all our orders online. So it's, it's very different than the way I used to run my business with our old company. I mean, here I have to meet with my sales team regularly on a daily basis for a 10 or 15 minute powwow each morning morning, um, constant follow-ups. I mean, as a CEO, I'm constantly in meetings every day. That's my life, is meetings. <laughs> and that, uh, and did, did you tweak your market focus at all? Or? With this company, it, it, you know, we do a very, very, very heavy brand. Um, you know, as you can see, you know, I, I, I'm pretty much the brand of the company and we decided. Right, you're all over the place. Yeah, so, and you know, that was not my choice. It was, um, you know, my husband's choice. You know, he felt that, you know, with this company, we want to put a face to a name and people resonate really well when they see a face to the name, and especially, you know, you know, I'm very personable, you know, my title is CEO, but I'm your typical average day person, very personable. I mean, I'll pick up the phone if any client wants to talk with me. So I, I'm not one of those people who, you know, has a chip on my shoulder or, oh, you know, you have to go through the proper routes to get to me. You know, if, ever, if anybody wants to talk to me, they can talk with me. And um, that's the way I run my business. And that's the way I market my business. You know, it's all about creating personal relationships with our clientele and, uh, you know, marketing ourselves in a very, very engaged personal way. And we feel it's working for us. Right. And you have an identity, I think, as a small business, which uh, folks like me, you know, I want to support that. I don't want to, you know, I'd rather deal with a small business than deal with some big corporation, you know. Uh, you know, and I think that I don't know. From my point of view, that works. That works. That's how you got me. <laughs> I, you know what? And and I have to agree with you. I think most people in your shoes would want to deal with a small with another small business owner, and hence that's why our uh, you know slogan is "We're a small business just like yourself." You know, I'm a small business owner. You know, I may have the title of a CEO, but again, you know, I clean the kitchen here. I'm the general manager. If you know, I need to take out the trash, I take out the trash, and at the end of the day, I go home and I'm a parent to my four children. Okay, so let's transition to the subject of what you're doing now and what the business of CorpNet is. So why don't you tell the viewers what you do as CorpNet uh, in your current business? So CorpNet.com provides new and existing business owners with the most comprehensive cost-effective services when it comes to starting, protecting, and managing a business. Uh, if a new business owner wants to start a business, we offer services such as registering a sole proprietorship, partnership through a fictitious business name filing, or if they want to get their business legal, uh, such as incorporating their business or form an LLC, we can offer those services as well to them and handle all the paperwork and hassle that goes with incorporating a business or forming an LLC. And we offer the services in all 50 states. Right. Yeah. One of the things on this show, we, we don't do any pay to play. We don't do any advertising and uh, only endorse stuff that we think uh, we think is good. And, and I, you know, I definitely recommend uh, you guys. So that's just from an honest point of view. So, so I, I have to ask you, how was your experience with CorpNet.com? Uh, well, you know, my experience was I thought I had plenty of time, uh, <laughs> but I found out. <laughs> I found out that in California, they uh, the, the 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 state itself sits on the uh, on the business uh, on the processing unless you pay them some extra fee, which to me sounds like some sort of a legal bribe. So yeah, I had hoped for doing one of the longer term options that would have cost me less, but you know I I just waited too long, and that's one thing I would say to people is that you have to be aware that the filing. Uh, processing time just in the state can take some time, so you yes. know, get on it as quickly as you can. Especially with California. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, is that typical of other states, or is that just California? You know, all you know, we do our 
services in all 50 states and every state varies, you know, so it really depends and varies from state to state. Generally speaking, most states turnaround time, if you were to go with a standard filing service, would be anywhere between, I would say, 10 and 20 business days. California just, you know, because of their staff shortages, you know, their standard processing, it takes about four to six months, you know, then they have an express option where, you know, they'll file the documents for you, you know, within 24 hours of us walking the documents into the state for you, but it takes 20 to 30 business days to get the filing back. And then you have the 24 hour, that's really super fast. So in the interest of completeness, I have to ask you to kind of go through, uh, you know, the different forms of a business and what they mean just a, as a thumbnail, because uh, there is a lot of information uh, available on your website and uh, all over the internet uh, that you've offered and, and that other people have offered. So there's lots of stuff, and some of this is actually better read, but just the high-level overview, what are the different forms and what are they best for? So I'm going to highlight all the different business structures for you, and then my recommendation to anybody is to go to our website at corpnet.com because not only we have a business structure chart that highlights all the different types of business structures, but it also, you know, provides you with a listing of the pros and cons of each business structure and what's best for a small business owner. In addition to that, we just came out with a free application tool, which is called our Business Structure Wizard, which allows a small business owner to basically go through the wizard simply answer a few questions and then the wizard would spit out a recommended business structure to you based on the answers you've given it as to what's best for your particular business. Oh, that's great. So going back to the business structures, I mean, for a small business owner, you know, you have the sole proprietorship, which is the simplest form of business entity. It's basically one person doing business under their own name or under a fictitious business name. So example, if I wanted to do business under my own name, I would do it as Nellie A. Kalp, you know, and, you know, let's say I have a bakery shop, you know, but I call it Nellie A. Kalp. Most people don't want to do that. They want to, you know, come up with a creative business name. So if I were to open up a bakery shop, but I didn't want to have it set up under my name and I wanted to, you know, conduct business under a fake business name, which is called a fictitious business name filing, then as a sole proprietor, I would file what is called a DBA, doing business as, and, you know, uh, set up the business as Nellie's Cupcakery or Nellie's Bakery, okay? So even if you were doing it as Nellie A. Kalp's Bakery, still a fictitious business name, correct? Correct, correct. And um, the, the, the doing business as filing, also referred to as a fictitious business name filing, it's a one-page document that gets filed with the state or county, giving notice to the public, and sometimes needs to be published in the newspaper for anywhere from two to four weeks that you know, this business is a sole proprietorship and is doing business under this name. A sole proprietorship doesn't offer a small business owner any sort of liability protection because you as the business owner are doing business under simply a fake business name. There is no corporate shield or corporate umbrella, hence um, opening you up to liability, God forbid, if there's a lawsuit down the line or if anybody or a potential creditor or third party wants to come after and sue you, you know, if they got poisoned with the food or the cupcake, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if there's a lawsuit, they're going to come after you and uh, they can go after your personal assets, anything and everything you own as a person. So good if you have absolutely nothing to lose. Yes, <laughs> I guess. I don't recommend a sole providership to anybody, you know. Um, and uh, then you have the partnership, which is basically a sole proprietorship, but for two or more people, okay? Same idea. Uh, partnership is like a marriage. So uh, I always tend to advise my friends and colleagues that, you know, if you really, you know, go into a partnership with someone, as if you, you think you would trust them to get married with them, you know, because a partnership, basically, it's like a marriage. 
it's two small business owners or more wanting to do business together and then any act of one will bind the other you know and again there's no uh, liability protection because there's no corporate shield or umbrella so if the business gets sued in a partnership the third party can go after both or either of the partners and right. all their personal assets are up for stake then you have the business structures that create liability protection and a corporate shield so the most formal of them all is a C corporation a corporation is the most formal type of business structure out there Basically, you form a corporation by filing articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State's office. And with a formal corporation, there is tons of formalities and requirements that you have to abide by to keep the corporation in compliance. With a corporation, you have shareholders, directors, officers. And with a C corporation, you have that double taxation, whereby once the corporation gets taxed at the corporate level if there's profits, and then once the corporation pays out dividends to its shareholders, the shareholders get taxed at the individual level. Right. Then after the C corporation, you have the S corporation. Okay. And the S corporation is great for a small business owner. And those are, that's one of the business structures that we recommend to small business owners. And in fact, right now we are tending to see tons of more small business owners leaning toward the s corporation over the llc for numerous reasons but generally speaking the s corporation is great for a small business owner who can qualify and again it starts out as a c corporation but what you see with the s corporation is that double taxation avoidance because if the small business owner can qualify and if the IRS accepts their election, then what happens is the IRS will view the corporation as an S corporation for tax purposes, allowing that shareholder or shareholders of the corporation to avoid paying taxes at the corporate level and only paying taxes at the individual level. So again, we see tons of S corporations with small business owners, one man corporations, two person corporations and if you can qualify and meet the IRS requirements which is you have to be a citizen or resident of the US you have to have at a maximum 100 shareholders and only one class of stock if you meet those requirements then you can qualify and if the IRS accepts your election this is a great entity structure for a small business owner because um, unlike the LLC which I'll cover in a minute with the S corporation, we're seeing tons of small business owners lean towards the S corp versus the LLC um, recently because with an S corporation, only a percentage of your profits from the business are subject to social security, self-employment tax, whereas with an LLC, 100% of the profits are subject to self-employment or social security tax. So more and more small business owners are opting for the S Corp over the LLC. Okay. Um, moving on to the LLC, which stands uh, for Limited Liability Company. This is a newer type of a business structure. It's created by state statute. Um, all 50 states offer this business structure. And again, this is a great, great business structure for a small business owner who cannot qualify to be an S Corporation or who alternatively doesn't want to deal with the headaches and the corporate formalities that a typical S corporation or C corporation offer. With the LLC, you get the best of both worlds. With an LLC, you get that liability protection, which it, it provides you with liability protection in that if somebody comes to sues you, sue you or go after your personal assets, they can't because you're an LLC you have that liability protection so god forbid if you get sued by a potential third party they can only go after uh to the extent of what the llc has as assets or profits in addition the llc has minimal paperwork and formalities simply as long as you have an operating agreement between yourself and the llc or amongst yourself and the members of the llc that's simply the one piece of agreement that controls the LLC. And uh, 
hence minimal, minimal paperwork, unlike the S corporation or the C corporation where you have bylaws, minutes, tons and tons of paperwork, which for a small business owner sometimes may be tedious and they may not want that headache, so they opt for the LLC. Okay. So for, for a, a business, uh, though, that's looking to be acquired, would want to maybe go more toward a corporation or? You know, that's a great question. Um, generally speaking, what we see for small business owners who are considering possibly getting venture capital from day one, we definitely try to um, have them consider going the C corporation route because the C corporation route is great for a small business who's trying to uh, secure venture capital or attract investors. For a small business owner who's not trying to attract investors but simply has an exit strategy in mind later down uh, the line, we typically recommend the LLC and then at some point, you know, they can always convert to a corporation. So you can go back and forth, but well, not back and forth, but you can change it at least once, right? Well, I mean, an S corporation starts off as a C corporation to begin with. So as long as you're a C corporation, you can either remain a C corporation or if you decide you want to elect S corporation status, for a newly formed corporation, it's 75 days from the time you formed to bring your election into existence or from the time you started doing business or, you know, acquired shares. And then uh, for an existing corporation, it's always uh, by March 15th of the following year. Okay, well, that's good to know. So what are some of the misconceptions that you find that people, they think they know about this whole deal that you find is probably one of the, some of the mo more uh, pervasive myths? Um, I would say I've broken it down to five, and we I, I tend to label it as the five most common mistakes to starting a small business. Generally speaking, the first most common mistake we see is whenever a small business owner wants to start a business, the most exciting part about starting a business is naming the business. And oftentimes, they fail to check the name for availability and then find themselves in a tr at the wrong end of a trademark dispute. So a quick solution to that is if you're starting a business, make sure you check that name for availability before you start printing up business cards, putting up a website and start conducting business under that name. Quick way to do this is go to a reputable online company such as the one we provide here at corpnet.com and just check the name for availability in your state and do a knockout search with the trademark office. And we offer both of those uh, services free off the uh, homepage of our website. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't check in all 50 states or anything like that? Or, but Actually, it does. If you do the knockout search um, uh, via our free trademark search tool, it checks to see if there's any pending or registered trademarks in all 50 states with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And then if you do our free business name search, we can check to see if the name that you're planning to start your business under is available under, you know, in the state or county that you plan to conduct your business within. Terrific, terrific. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I would say, is selecting the wrong business structure for your business. And uh, this, we see this a lot whereby, you know, somebody, you know, starts off as an S corporation and should have been an LLC, or they start off as an LLC and they should have been as an S corporation, et cetera. And again, you know, we have a tool for this as well. It's our free business structure wizard, whereby it, uh, it's a wizard that asks you a series of questions. And then at the end of the three minute online session, it spits out and recommends a business structure that is, you know, right for your particular business and your situation. And it's been, you know, created by attorneys and CPAs, our in-house attorneys and CPAs, and it's a great tool. And, uh, you know, our business owners that, you know, use it, rant and rave about it to date. Great. And what, what's the most common gotcha in that when people, what, what, do, you, what do people have that they suddenly go, oh my gosh, I should have been a something else? I mean, a, 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 a lot of times, you know, what we see is their CPAs letting them know that, well, you know what, 
you really should have been an S Corp, but you opted for the LLC, even though you qualified for the S Corp. And now, you know, you're, you're, you're having to pay all these taxes because with an LLC, 100% of your profits are subject to self-employment tax, whereas with an S corporation, only a percentage are subject. So we're, we're, we're starting to see a trend in more and more small business owners opting for the S corporation over the LLC because, you know, they're saving more money. They can leave the money in the business. I mean, if you have a high revenue, high profit business, um, you know, we're seeing a ton of business owners opting for the S corp over the LLC because if they go with the LLC in a high profit business, 100% of the LLC's profits would be subject to taxes, whereas with the S Corp, it wouldn't. Okay. So we have uh, business naming, uh, we have uh, uh, the business for structure. And the third, which is the most, most common one, is incorporating in, in, in the wrong state. And if I recall correctly, you sent me two other questions, and one of them dealt with this. And right. oftentimes, you know, there's this misnomer that, you know, Incorporate in Nevada, incorporate in Delaware, incorporate in Wyoming. And, you know, that, that's a huge, huge, huge misconception. And uh, incorporating in the wrong state can have serious, serious ramifications and can subject the small business owner to tons of more filing fees and uh, taxes when, in the first place, they didn't have to be subjected to. So we see this as a huge mistake. Yeah, I know for me, you know, uh, after having read a couple of things from, uh, from uh, you know, mostly, you know, internet startups, you know, tech startups, they're all, oh, absolutely, file, you know, as a Delaware corporation, don't do anything else. So when I came to do my corp corporation, I said, okay, I'm looking to file a Delaware corporation, who can do the Delaware corporation for me? And then when I got into it, I found, well, you know, I'm still, I'm living in California, my address is in California, and for those reasons... Uh, I wasn't really going to get out of any taxes. It wasn't like I was not going to pay taxes. So here's the bottom line for a small business owner who's, you know, either a solo, you know, one man show or has a few employees. You generally want to incorporate in the state where the business is located, that you're con conducting your business, you're transacting your business, where you live, where the shareholders live, because at the end of the day, incorporating in Delaware and Nevada, although those states offer great, 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 um, you know, opportunities, you know, Delaware is very pro-corporation and has a lot of uh, favorable laws for corporations. Nevada, they don't have the state income tax, but the bottom line is if you don't live there, um, forming the corporation or LLC in those states it's going to subject you to having to foreign qualify in the state that you're ultimately living in and conducting your business in. And at the end of the day, now what you've done is subjected yourself to two states' requirements, filing requirements, compliance requirements, and tax laws and state fees. So generally speaking, the bottom line is incorporate in the state that you're planning to conduct your business in. You're going to save yourself a ton of headache down the line. Right. It seemed to me to be a big boys game. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to, if you're if you're a big company, it might make sense. So. I mean, yes, you know, I mean, if if you know, if if you're gonna start a business and literally, you know, at the eleventh hour, you're gonna be acquired by some ginormous corporation, then yeah, Delaware would be something you want to consider, somewhere you would consider, but. You know, if you're a small business owner running a company in California, for example, you have no business, you know, setting up in Delaware or Nevada. <laughs> Got it. And if you do, you're going to have to come in for and qualify the business in California. Right, right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the fourth, the fourth uh, thing. The fourth uh, issue that we see is failing to get the proper permits, licenses, and often filing fictitious business names filings if you're uh, conducting your business under a variation of the name uh, that you've incorporated or formed an LLC under. Again, this is not a huge area, but you know you got to make sure you got those business licenses and permits, you know, in a row. And if you need one, obtain one. And then. Um, uh, the other one is failing to obtain a tax ID number. Tons of small business owners 
thank God they can uh, use their social security. You don't want to be giving out your social security number to every client and vendor that you're going to be dealing with. So you, you'll need to get a tax ID number. It's free. You can update it directly from the IRS website or you can come to a reputable document filing service such as our company and we can obtain it for you for a minimal fee. And uh, again, you'll need the tax ID um, as it's assigned to the corporation or LLC to conduct business. That's the way the IRS will identify your business and you'll need it to open up a bank account. Right, right. Along with the fictitious business name statements, as I, yeah. as I found out. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so when you talk about the fictitious business name being filed for all forms, you're talking about like for us, Small Business File Inc. Uh, doing business as I do, also do business as Ludlow Media, which is my production company, but uh, also as uh, smallbusinessfile.com. Exactly. So let's say that a small business owner would like to set up a corporation as John Doe Inc., but John Doe Inc. also it has a website called John Doe's website.com and John Doe's Bakery and John Doe's, you know, website services. So John Doe Inc. is conducting um, the corporation under various different business names. If you want those various different business names to fall under the corporate umbrella, then that corporation has to file a fictitious business name filing, giving notice to the public that not only it's a corporation as John Doe Inc., but John Doe Inc. also does business as John Doe website.com, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all the things that you might be putting yourself out there as. Correct. Okay. So most of the viewers for this show are small business owners already. And I figure if they're thinking about, if, if they're watching this at all, it's because they are uh, interested in either doing something different from what they're doing and forming something new or transitioning from where they are to, uh, to uh, uh, and, and becoming, taking what they're doing and incorporating it for the liability protection. So uh, in terms of the, the, the that latter one, in terms of uh, uh, taking, you know, you're already a sole proprietorship and you just want to continue doing business, but you want to form a new company. It's not, I found, it's not that simple because, you know, you just can't take your books and transfer them over. It's really a complete new thing. Can you talk about what uh, things people need to think about when they, when they do this? Absolutely. So for a small business owner who's running their business as a sole proprietorship and has uh, decided that they want to legalize the business and form a corporation or LLC, um, you can start the incorporation LLC formation process, but it, it's, as you know, you mentioned, it's a whole different ball game. So you gotta wind down and close down the books on the sole proprietorship. And once a corporation or LLC, you know, you have to open up the new bank account and open up the books conducting the business as a corporation or LLC. Um, you know, my ultimate, ultimate nugget of advice here is, don't leave anything hanging and unfinished. Close the books on whatever business that you've started and now are deciding to take it to the next level. So you got to wind down the books on the sole prop. Make sure your tax advisor or accountant has that news and has knowledge of the fact that you're changing business structures. And once a corporation or LLC, it's its own separate book, separate tax filings, and everything starts from ground zero. Okay. And and by the end of the year, you really need to be done with all the books on your prime on your original sole proprietorship. I mean, you know, timing of, you know, switching business types, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, we recommend, you know, I mean, if it's, if you're, if, if like right now, you know, it's the summertime and if somebody is considering becoming a corporation or LLC, always at the end of the quarter, quarter or the beginning of the quarter is always a good time to consider. But, um, Generally speaking, any time, you know, is better than, the sooner the, the better. <laughs> okay. And then uh, for, the, for, the, for the business owner that's just uh, continuing, uh, you know, their existing business and starting something new. So, you know, the, the plumber uh, has invented a new something and he wants to take that to market. So everybody wants to start a new corporation on that. Um, how, 
you know, what are, are there any things that he needs to consider in the separation? Keep it separate. Keep separate books. Do not commingle. And because at, at some point down the line, you run the risk with any business that the IRS is going to come after you and audit you. In fact, we just went through a huge audit ourselves because, you know, um, in our business, you know, uh, for the first two years, you know, of a small business, we were claiming losses. So, you know, the IRS always is a red flag to them because they want to see, OK, is this a viable business? So they we did a full audit. And, you know, the key to coming out of an audit and being a winner is you got to keep accurate records and keep everything separate, especially with ours. You know, my husband and I have several different business ventures and entities and uh, what helped us tremendously was the fact that we had uh, different sets of book for all our different types of business entities, and that really helped at the end of the day. Yeah. In fact, I was talking to a restaurant owner uh, uh, recently who said that he's, you know, he's about to expand to a new restaurant, same same restaurant, just another location, and he's going to form a whole entirely new corporation for that second restaurant. Yeah, and I, t I write a ton of content on this, Reese, where uh, you're conducting uh, multiple businesses at the same time. And there are tons of different ways you can structure multiple businesses. You can create separate entities for each business, or you can create a holding company and uh, place all the different businesses under one company. And again, I write a ton of content on this exact topic. You can find it on our website. You can find it on Small Business Trends, which I'm an author and small business expert at. And uh, it, it's great content and good information to know and keep in mind. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to be here with us. Thank you, Reese. It's such a pleasure and I'm humbled by the opportunity. Thank you. Our guest has been Nellie Akalp from CorpNet. And you can find more information about CorpNet and uh, a link to their website at the bottom of this page.